Thanks for listening to the podcast of our event, Loneliness, the Big Picture. We join as the chair, Yasmin Alavai brown shares her own experience of loneliness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's very good to be here. What a grand place. It's like a wedding hall, isn't it? Um, I'm not going to take up too much time, but I thought since I was asked to do this, um, share some um, thoughts. And the three speakers, what I know of them, I will introduce them in a minute, have um, highlighted one or more of these aspects. But things to be thinking about, um, I think. I do not normally feel lonely. I'm quite happy being alone. But it's the first time I really, twice in my life, experienced intense, painful loneliness came this March when my um, only uh, older sister died of COVID. And she was mentally ill. We hadn't been able to see each other. But the thing that loneliness, I mean, I then understood what people mean, really, in my heart rather than intellectually. It was, she was the last person of my birth family. I was now utterly alone. Nobody was around me who knew who I was, where I came from. And you find this a lot in migrant communities, that this sense of the people who linked them, rooted them, when they go, there's no other word but intense loneliness that takes over to the point of kind of almost thinking you're going a bit mad, um, you know, feeling unlocked from so much uh, that stabilizes you. The other things I wanted to kind of just put, uh, uh, I'm not be, going to be at the, at the big conference, um, is what I know uh, Rena and the other two panels have been thinking about for longer than I have, but how Loneliness is a result of political decisions that are made, of economic decisions that are made, both personal and at the macro level. The changes in society, um, um, the internal changes we go through. I mean, the last three years, I forgot what it was like to be in a, except with I, my husband and I have been together, but moving out the first time and seeing human beings, uh, you had to almost relearn the art of communication, um, um, all the scientific and technological developments. They've been absolutely wonderful, but also devastating in that they make you, make you feel very lonely sometimes. I mean, I get targeted by trolls appallingly, appallingly, and it can make us, those of us who are picked on, actually feel everybody hates me, I, I'm all alone. You know, these kind of really powerful internal uh, shocks to the system. Um, and, and so the thing that communi- made the world that able to communicate has ended up in a lot of loneliness, and the young people in particularly. I mean, the, I'll end with this. I was just invited by a city, um, very rich city firm, to come and do a training session on how to get their young people to talk to each other. They, they've forgotten the art of talking, talking to each other in the workplace. And that's not just over the COVID period. It is, so he said to me, he said, I really need you to come and teach them just to talk, not to go out in the evening and get hammered, you know, but to actually just exchange nice little things or share things. How extraordinarily depressing is that? But here here we are. Um, I hope eventually we'll be talking about the generational uh, uh, divide that causes loneliness, the race divides, the gender divides, Um, my mother-in-law, who was a white working-class woman, I'll never forget it. She said, I've been lonely all my life. I said, why is that, Vera? She said, because I couldn't do the things I wanted and I couldn't tell anybody what I wanted. And so when everybody, you know, when, when in fact her husband, my father-in-law died, 
she felt less lonely. So these things are quite complicated. And so I'm very pleased to um, be here with such wonderful young people who've thought about these things so much. Narina, I've, I've met over the years, um, and uh, she's, you know, we all know how deeply impressive she is. Um, author of several books, The Silent Takeover, The Death Threat, Eyes Wide Open. I haven't read Eyes Wide Open, but I will very soon. Um, and the, the Lonely Century, A Call to Reconnect. Um, I remember, I thought she was still at Cambridge because that's where, where I identified her home, but she's now here in London at UCL. John Yates is a, a <laughs> this has been handed to me, so I'm really intrigued, I'm going to go and look this up, a recovering stand-up. Um, and in his own words, he failed very fast. Um, and a community worker, McKinsey consultant, youth worker, international development worker. He co-founded co a number of charities, and I do remember the National Charity, uh, National Citizen Service, lead policy advisor to the UK's education secretary. Which one? Uh, Damien Hines. Okay. And, um, People always want to check that. I will check one. that too. <laughs> check, check, check. He, uh, he's the executive director of the Youth Endowment Fund and author of Fractured, Why Our Societies Are Coming Apart and How We Put Them Back Together Again. Um, and Fractured is a book which apparently, again, I haven't read it. A very simple idea. The more time we spend with people unlike ourselves, doing things together, um, the more understanding, tolerant, and, and can, I presume connected and less lonely we feel. Um, I'm just going to end with a story. I just was um, uh, something that happened recently. Um, and John... And Will Tanner, we've met, I think, somewhere in my long journey anyway in life. Um, his report, recent report, um, and this is really interesting, that younger people have fewer friends, um, trust people less, and are more alienated from their communities than ever before. And yet young people are always on the phone, always online, always, always yabbering, aren't they, one way or another? And yet this, so this is extraordinarily interesting. Um, how can we ensure that the importance of, you know, that we, we get the young uh, better at understanding and, and doing um, something about this very artificial society? He was at the uh, uh, think tank reform at, uh, before getting into politics in 2014, uh, policy advisor to Theresa May when she was at a home sec the Home Secretary, special advisor on immigration, crime, and extremism after Cameron resigned. These are difficult parts of your own history and the country's history. Um, he was then appointed deputy head of the policy unit in Downing Street. He resigned and um, now advises on, on various aspects of um, government policies. Um, I won't go through, it's quite an Im incredibly impressive uh, CV. So I'm going to start with um, um, Narina and um, maybe with the widest question of all, why are we talking about this now? It's been a something that's been kind of in the air for a very long time. So why is it so important now? What, where do you fit in? So, so why now? Well, um, let me share with you just a few kind of vignettes of people who I came across over the last few years as I was researching my new book, or like, yes, or kind of stories. Um, Saito San, a pensioner in Tokyo, who resides in Toshigo prison, um, having intentionally committed a crime, shoplifting, in order to be jailed there because she's so lonely. The fastest growing demographic of people being incarcerated in Japan at the moment are over 65 year olds. 
and researchers believe that, so, that the reason for this is because so many are looking for company and connection and can only find it in jail. In Paris, Eric, the far-right Le Pen voter, who shared with me how lonely he would have felt had he not found community in Le Pen's party. Claudia, the 16-year-old teenager, who told me about how excluded and isolated she felt when her friends had told her that they weren't going out after school, um, but she was in her room scrolling on her social media feeds and she saw them going out and she's in her room for a week. She felt so marginalized alone. Or Hashim, the London Uber driver, who told me about how despite driving around all day with people, he's scared to speak to them in case he gets rated badly as a result. We're living at a time in which increasing numbers of people are feeling disconnected, atomized, and lonely, in which increasing numbers of people feel that they're not seen, that they're not heard, and that they don't have agency. Um, how have we got here? Um, I'm sure we'll all kind of talk a bit about this, but I'll just go very quickly on four drivers, just for technology that you've raised already. Of course, this is definitely part of the problem. Um, our screens in themselves, these weapons of mass distraction, really do keep us um, disconnected from others in the room. Researchers have found that even when people just have a smartphone on a table between them, they are less connected and feel less empathetic towards each other, even when it's turned off. Social media um, ostensibly designed to keep us together, but actually proving to divide and serve as a divisive force. And then the rise of contactless living, um, ordering your food on Deliveroo rather than going to a cafe, ordering your groceries online rather than going to a shop, doing your yoga on YouTube rather than going to a studio. Of course, massively accelerated by the pandemic, but creating um, increasing patterns of behavior that in which we don't interact face-to-face, -face, which matters. We also do less with others, as we know, than in the past. We're less likely to be members of trade unions, less likely to be members of parent-teacher associations, less likely to go to church. We're doing less with others. Mass urbanization, another factor. Rural communities feeling, as a consequence, abandoned and city dwellers feeling um, increasingly anonymous in, in cities where people rush by who don't even know their name. And then, of course, what we might think of as the neoliberal project playing a significant part here too. Um, partly because of its economic outcomes, partly because of the fact that it um, presided over a period in which inequalities widens and increasing numbers of people felt forsaken, abandoned, marginalized, because they were, um, but also because of what we might think of as a neoliberal mindset, which increasingly took hold, one in which we came as a society to valorize qualities like competitiveness and aggression at the expense of qualities like caring for each other and kindness, a mindset in which we became increasingly individualistic and eye-focused. We even see this in pop song lyrics where since the 1980s, we see words like we, us, and our steadily supplanted by words like I, me, myself, an I-focused world, inevitably a lonelier world. Um, loneliness thrives in a particular ecosystem, political, economic, technological, social, which means that if we are to come together, and we're talking about the big picture here today, um, if we are to build an inclusive democracy in which everyone feels that they do have a stake and that they do belong, uh, government, civil society, business, us as individuals all do have roles to play, but because we're talking about the big picture and because there's so many policy-focused people in the room, I just wanted to finish with just three thoughts on what government, I believe, needs to do. First, essential is to mitigate technologies anti-democratic externalities. Um, we know that social media is part of the problem. Um, and the online safety bill that is currently going through Parliament could, um, depending on how it ends up actually being um, legislated, could play an important role here. But it's also about government actively helping physical, our physical shops, our physical high streets, um, 
strive, they anchor and nurture our communities. But more than that, it's in those micro connections, in those exchanges in the grocery store, when we stop and help somebody um, who's reaching for a jar. It's when we go to a yoga studio and think about where to put our mats so that we don't downward dog in someone else's face. <laughs> Those are moments in our life when we practice democracy, when we practice the skills that underpin it, reciprocity, civility, caring for others. So refund, um, nurturing our local communities, our physical shops, stores, cafes, creating potentially a new tax status for community, pro-community businesses could all play a part. More generally, we need, and I'm sure everyone in this room would agree with this, we need to refund the infrastructure of community, public parks, public libraries, youth clubs, elderly daycare centers, daycare centers. People need physical spaces to do things together if they are to come together. And then we need to engineer situations to do things together with people who are not like us. I'm sure you'll speak more on this, but you know, I'll just race through a few initiatives. The macro initiative pilot project of voluntary um, um, civic, of civic service for teenagers. The CAMD and Council um, participatory democracy initiative where the climate change policy of CAMD and Council was co-created by citizens. Chicago, the city of Chicago building social housing projects with branches of the Chicago Public Library in the ground floor, not only to be spaces for local, for people who live in the blocks to congregate, but also for people in the neighborhoods who otherwise might have thought, well, we don't want this in our backyard, actually gives them a reason to go there, shared cooking, shared drama classes, shared sport classes um, in schools with, with different socioeconomic, ethnic um, makeups. These are all just a few ideas. I'm sure my other panelists are full of ideas too. I'm sure you are too. Because this may be the lonely century, but it doesn't have to remain so. The future really is in all of our hands. Thank you very much. As ever, as ever inspiring, Norina. You, you, you've always done this so beautifully well. Um, we go to John next, um, and um, we now know uh, the, the loneliness beyond COVID, uh, um, that more than a million people had become, had become, I think many of them still are, chronically lonely. Um, in your book, you, you argue that, but you see it another way, that that COVID actually created a new opportunity to rethink who we are and where we are in the human family, from what I um, understand. And, and how to use that opportunity um, is, is what you've been thinking and talking about. So I'm fascinated to hear that. Shall we all up? Thank you. I mean, I think we've, we've been talking about sort of the, the where, where people come together, the glue, if you like, that, that unites us with others. And obviously is key to reducing our, our loneliness. And I, I think glue matters. Um, I say that as a father of three small children who are constantly covering everything with glue. Um, but I, I, I think the average person knows that social institutions, that glue matters. It, when, when, you, you, when you talk to, um, uh, to, to, to most people in, in, in the West, they know there's a real problem. And they, we, we'll, polling picks this up so strongly, particularly around one of the consequences of a lack of glue, which is division. So eight out of ten Americans think that their country is either mainly or entirely divided. The majority of British people think that their society has never been as divided as it is right now. Good news. They're right about something. Unfortunately, they're right about something bad. You know, they're right that we've got a, we've got a real problem. And I think we can see it. We don't need a big piece of polling necessarily, though it sometimes helps. We can see it in our friendship groups, if we're really frank, for many of us. So half of us, of those of us who have degrees, have almost entirely friends who only have degrees. The vast majority of people uh, who have retired have no contact at all with anyone under the age of 35 unless it's their grandchildren. There are some wonderful outliers to these statistics, of course. The a fifth of those who voted to leave the European Union 
quarter of those who voted to remain, don't have a single friend that voted the other way. The stats for Republicans and Democrats are worse in the US. Half of us have no uh, friends from a different ethnic background. And yet the biggest divide of all here in the UK is wealth. A UK barrister operating, let's say, in London would have to invite 100 people in their social network round before they'd be likely to invite someone who was unemployed. A few months ago, they'd have to broke the law with regard to how many people they need in their garden to meet someone who is unemployed. We live in these little solos, in these little silos. Why is it happening? Um, well, again, I think the average person has a much better idea than someone like me who writes a book. So, you know, when I talk to people about division, eventually someone will say, oh, come on, John. Hasn't it always been this way? And in fact, birds of a feather flock together. Francis Evans, um, in 1953, uh, followed 150 door-to-door -door salespeople around uh, the United States of America. I, my first ever job, it's not on that list, was door-to-door -door sales. It's a really tough job. Um, and what he found was they were more likely to make a sale if they sold to someone who voted the same way that they did. They were more likely to make a sale if they sold to someone who was the same height that they were. They were more likely to make a sale if they sold to someone who earned the same amount of money as they did. What Evans discovered has now been backed up by 37,000 different studies, and it, scientists call it homophily. It's a slight preference towards people like us. I, I term it people like me syndrome. It's a small, small, constant bias that the majority of us have. And it really matters. But why have we become more divided right now? Okay, I said I could sort of get into this. Well, I've, said, told, I've completely so far failed to answer that question. Because I've said there's something that's constant. Well, a constant can't explain the change. Any more for you said, why is it a bit rainy at the moment? And I said, well, the sun, right? It, it partly explains the change in temperature, but it doesn't fully explain it. What's changed? And Narina's there before me, of course, as, as, as so often with this stuff. We've seen a loss of something. What have we lost? There's a tribe in northern Tanzania called the Hadza, who are super remarkable. And there's about 500 of them, and they've lived there for 60,000 years. And every, once a month, when the, when, the, when the sky is totally dark, this group, who are one of the few hunter-gatherer remaining groups in the, in the world, will gather together and dance. They perform something called the apem. The men go and hide, and the first man comes out, and he's got black ostrich feathers on his, uh, behind his head, and he's wearing a black cape. And he holds a rattle and bells around one leg and he leads off in a dance. The women join in and the children join in. And the apem lasts for about two or three hours and they do it once a month. Why are they doing it? It serves no obvious purpose. It's not part of any religious beliefs that they have. It doesn't resolve disputes. They don't have an obvious hierarchy that it plays into. What is the point of it? Anthropologists followed the Hadza for a decade. I can't believe they got about this much funding. They followed them for a decade to find out why they were dancing. And they found this. The Hadza are biased. They're biased towards people who are from their little nuclear family, people like me syndrome, but they're more biased towards people who dance the Apem with them. That little institution forms a bond between people who see each other as slightly different. It reduces their loneliness, reduces their anxiety, and connects them together. We don't even have a term. This is how disinterested we've become in this stuff. We don't even have a term for an institution that does that. I call it the common life. The Hadza have a common life. It's called the Apem. And actually, once you start looking, you can see a common life throughout history in human societies. So when we were foragers, we had rituals like the Apem. When we were farmers, we turned to feast days and religious services. And they weren't a small deal. The average 15th century English person spent one day in five in such an event. And when we were factory workers, we came to rely on clubs and societies, mandatory schooling, normally very local, but you didn't get to choose where you went to school, and the local workplace. The reason we've become divided, the reason we've primarily become lonely, is that common life of our grandparents has withered away. Every generation since 1945 in the UK has been less likely to be part of a club and a society. So what do we do about it? My view is we need to be clear why this has happened. And partly it's about change. Our societies have changed fast. And whether that's part of liberal, liberalism or neoliberalism, whatever we want to call it, or whether that's the invention of the television, or whether that's just the change in our values, which started around 1950, people are interested in different things than they were when clubs and societies boomed up. 
we've got to find a new way, invent a new way. But who's putting funding in? Where are the investment funds going in to create new innovative ways of connecting people? I don't see any of that. Finally, we've got to look to the government. Some of the main things that brought up grandparents and great-grandparents together were not voluntary, they were mandatory. Your children went to school and they went to the local school. Most people didn't choose where they worked, they worked at the local workplace. Where are the new mandatory institutions? Whether it's something like Macron is doing in France, based on the National Citizen Service, I should say, um, or whether it's uh, a creation of perhaps when we get good, de if we finally provide decent childcare support, a mandatory requirement to find how a children's brain works and develops when they're born, with people, maybe parents from across town we don't know. And I would say a moment at retirement to actually invest in people as they retire, but to require them to come together to mix with people in their town to learn about retirement and reconnect with their community. Uh, that, to me, is a, is a manifesto to try and actually make a difference to the issue of loneliness and get division thrown in at the same time. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so, on to Will. Um, Onward's recent report, and we've just heard this earlier, younger people have fewer friends trust people less, I find this really quite shocking actually, um, and are more alienated from their communities um, than ever before. Uh, how can we, uh, same theme really, how can we enhance, encourage, build human connections? But to all three of you, when we have our questions, I would like us to consider that there are problems with community life. Uh, there's a difference between, a, a, and I was born and raised in a community, and I can't tell you how I hate the bloody word <laughs> community, because it was so oppressive. Everybody knew everything you were and was limiting your, your imagination and your chances in life. Um, and the other point is, of course, I think maybe history is cyclical. I'm sure people you know, the agricultural and industrial revolution had the 100%. same thing 100%. happen, yeah. right? So in a way we should learn from Couldn't back then. So ro the round trees and the Cadburys who set up these amazing charities that are still going mm -hmm. were responding to that. Yeah. We don't have these rich men and women thinking about leaving this legacy, mm -hmm. which ha is continuing to help so much important work. So we'll... Over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Yasmin. And um, I should say I feel particularly kind of uh, like I've underperformed in life because I'm sitting on a panel with several people who've written books and I have no, not yet done so. So, um, uh, so it's, it's fantastic it's to be here. It's a very lonely thing to it do. Is, <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. Um, so, but, but I think this, this, issue is, this issue is fundamentally important. I think it's really fundamentally important to our politics. Um, uh, all of our research shows a really strong relationship between the kind of decline in what we might call community uh, or belonging and uh, some of the political volatility that we've seen in recent years. Um, I'm going to throw a few more statistics at you. Uh, there have been some already, but um, so 71% of people, according to our polling, and that's quite a consistent result across multiple polls, say that their community has declined in their lifetime. Um, uh, and if you look at most of the markers of connection uh, within society, whether it's volunteering, group membership, uh, philanthropy, uh, sitting down with, uh, with your family to have a meal um, in the evening, um, there's been a long-term secular deterioration across most of those markers over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and that's all very similar to what happened in the United States uh, as exposed by Robert Putnam um, in his brilliant book, Bowling Alone, uh, 20 odd years ago. Um, uh, and I think it's only just becoming visible in this country, actually, in a way that it was becoming visible in the States um, a few decades ago. Um, in, in this country, there's been a bit of a temptation to see this as a geographic is issue, um, in the sense that there are some places that are uh, that have stronger communities or, or, or kind of deeper wells of uh, of belonging and connectedness than, than others. And that is certainly true. Um, all of our research, looking at the kind of geographic atlas of, of community strength, shows that, that, that there is a very strong divide between places like East Anglia and the kind of M62 corridor um, uh, in the north of England compared to some parts of the southeast, for example, um, the former 
relatively disconnected, the latter um, relatively connected. Um, but I think there is always a risk if you look at this purely through the geographic lens, and I think we, we're in a kind of world of, of politics where people tend to think in terms of geography because of the electoral realignment that we're yeah. going through, um, that you miss out some really important stories. And when we did our research earlier this year looking at kind of generational trends within community, um, we were really struck by um, the data which showed just very clearly that this is as much if not more a generational issue than a geographic one. Um, so uh, Yasmin's already said a little bit about the kind of headline findings but the stats are really worth repeating because they are I think truly shocking. So just to give you um, some statistics. So um, we found that young people i.e. 18 to 35 year olds are around half as likely to say that they think other people uh, can be trusted generally um, than they were 60 years ago uh, in 1959 where there was an equivalent survey. So, uh, so in 1959, 56% of people said that most people, uh, young people, sorry, um, could be generally trusted. Uh, today we found that that figure is now 30%. Um, and that rate of decline for what it's worth is not the same across all generations. So that, that rate of decline is about half the rate of decline for older generations, for over 65s. Um, 18 to 24 year olds, so the youngest age group, are now more likely to distrust their neighbours um, than trust them, 48% to 35%, um, and three times more likely uh, to distrust their neighbours than people over the age of 65. So there's just a huge generational gap on kind of local neighbourhood social trust. Um, they're also, by the way, about half as likely to speak to their neighbours, a third less likely to borrow exchange favours than their neighbours than they were in 1998, so um, 20, 23 years ago. Um, and around one in five 18 to 35 year olds say that they have one or no close friends, um, which is just the kind of uh, mind-blowing statistic that hits you when you start going through a poll and you delve and you delve into it and try and understand well, first check it, which we did. We reran the poll um, and came up with the same result, um, and uh, try and delve to really understand it. Um, and that just just for comparison, um, compared to the, in the British Social Attitude Survey in 2011, 12, 10 years ago, um, that was uh, a third lower than uh, than that 21%. Um, uh, so it was, yeah, uh, there's been a really steep increase, um, and there is again a big generational gap. Um, now, I should caution that some of that will be a pandemic effect. Um, this poll was done um, uh, not during lockdown, but during uh, during the pandemic. And um, we'd expect there to be at least some, some effect. But if you look at the longitudinal data that the BSA uh, publishes, you can see a similar level of decline, especially amongst younger generations. Um, so we definitely have a big generational problem here. Um, uh, I, a few people have talked a little bit to the causes of this. My, my personal view is that we don't yet have anywhere near the level of understanding about what's driving this um, that we could or should do. Uh, I think technology probably is likely to be an answer, but my personal view is that social media, we may overstate the effect of social media compared to other forms of media. And John's done some brilliant work on television, um, which just in pure volume terms is a kind of extraordinary uh, proportion of our days. I think it's about five hours, uh, 40 minutes or something is the average telev television viewing time in this country um, now. Um, uh, and um, uh, and so I think media is part of the answer. I would also point to just general growing insecurity amongst younger generations. We're, younger generations obviously much less likely to own a home, much less likely to be in secure work, much less likely to be forming a family uh, before the age of 35. Um, and those statistics have only been going in one, uh, one direction over the last, um, uh, the last few years. Um, but statistically, the things that, um, that seem to have uh, the greatest effect or the greatest kind of correlation um, to, to indicators of neighbourhood co uh, cohesion um, are qualification level um, and levels of social participation. Um, so the latter is kind of self-explanatory. If you're joining groups, if you're volunteering, um, if you're giving to charity, then you're you're likely to be kind of have relatively high levels of kind of neighbourhood cohesion or, or, or social connection. Um, but the, the educational qualifications side of things, I think, is fascinating because people who have degrees are simply much less connected than people who don't. Um, uh, and that's likely to have um, a relationship to things like geographic mobility. You're much more likely to move away from your home if you uh, go to university than if you're not. Um, but there is a really interesting kind of side effect of the 
of the great educational experiment that we've been on in this country over the last 20 years is it may have made younger people much less likely to put down roots. Um, and, uh, and that may be feeding into a much wider issue around, around loneliness. Um, I, I realize I've already gone on for yes. quite a long time, so I'm not going to get into solutions, but maybe we can do that in the, um, in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, wonderful. A very uh, wide-ranging um, um, uh, three uh, uh, speeches. We'll, we'll have questions now, and if I can take three. If you want me to direct it at one particular panelist, please say so. And can I take three questions in bunches and then take it from there? So, do we have a mic? Yeah, there's a... So my name's Jill Rutter, uh, and I'm from the Fund of Spirit of 2012, and also an associate of British Future. My question is about kind of mixing, are we mixing up two very different conditions, kind of our bonding links with our most intimate friends, our family? I mean, for me, that really, the quality of those relationships really influences whether or not I feel lonely. And are bridging and linking relationships with people who are different uh, to us, that influences kind of trust, uh, influences kind of a sense of division. Aren't these two quite different uh, concepts with some similarities in terms of solutions, but are also dif some differences in terms of their policy solutions? Thank you. There was another hand up there, and uh, there's one there, and then... Sorry, I've got Parkinson's, so this might be a bit kind of beatboxy if I uh, end up <laughs> moving the mic away from my mouth, so hopefully you can hear me. Uh, I'm Emma, I'm a co-founder of a company called More Human, and we're basically trying to build software, not the evil kind, um, <laughs> that will basically help build social infrastructure for people that are um, wanting to step up and do grassroots events in their community, so trying to bring people together more often. The problem we're finding is that actually there's not the interest from sort of um, private equity um, funding. There's a lot of grants out there for what we're doing. How do we make um, community less soft and fluffy for kind of people to fund it and to actually make it an important thing on the agenda so it's not just, you know, something that gets kind of brushed under the carpet when it comes to um, money being put into it? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Iona Lawrence, um, and I well, work, but, but got nothing interesting to say about myself. <laughs> interesting question, though, um, uh, is there's been a really helpful focus on all of the drivers, and I did agree with Jill that we have to be careful about conflating uh, some of the kind of symptoms um, that we're seeing with the kind of deeper policies that might be or approaches to kind of alleviating some of the symptoms. But I'm interested in the like hopeful case. I think there are lots of people who can talk about the kind of divided experience of the last 18 months in particular. For some people, um, it's been a period of intense isolation and quite a lot of disconnection. And then for other people, it's been experienced as a moment of perhaps of coming together, perhaps uh, in your family units or perhaps connecting wider communities. And I'm interested in the panelists' reflections on what we've learned from the last 18 months and where you're looking to for, like, I suppose, a kind of hopes and, uh, as Will said at the end there, what, what solutions could look like. Because um, for those of us that have been engaged in this kind of space for a really long time, I think there's a kind of, there's a desire to push forward through the, the, the kind of the challenges and the issues into kind of, so what next? And I'd be really interested, particularly thinking about the last 18 months, what you've got to say about, um, yeah, where you're drawing hope from. Thank you. So, can, uh, Jill's question, um, John, do you want to take that? Uh, bonding and bridging. Yeah, I mean, the, I think it is helpful to, to think of these as, different things. So um, uh, bonding capital, meaning uh, connections with people who we feel are, are quite similar to us, bridging uh, feeling that we're connecting with people who in some way seem other to us. I think the challenge is that sometimes when you bridge, you realise you have quite a lot in common, and then it's suddenly bonding again. <laughs> so I do think these can be a little bit slippery at times. Um, I, 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 I think that 
you know, my, my general sort of uh, uh, work is, has been much more on what do we do about the bridging capital. I, I think the, the, the thing I would say that really links the two together, particularly though, is, is Will's point about uh, young people going to university and being incredibly lonely post-university. I, I think what we're seeing is a person who is, who is often moved away from home. They've lost their bonding connections. Any connection they form is going to be a new connection and it's likely to be a bridging connection. And it may in time become a bonding connection. So if I think about my, my dad was a vicar, you know, I, I've always gone to church. If I move to a new place, the first thing I'll do is probably join a church. I won't join a sports club because it'd be humiliatingly embarrassing. <laughs> but I have a thing that I'm going to join that at first I feel other. Now you might look at that and say, but you've got so much in common, you're all church goers. But to me, I don't know these people. But they become then people I connect with. So where are those institutions that the person who's moved away from home is going to find? And so I do think that, therefore, they do become quite linked. But we should be, we should be clear about some of the, the dangers. We come up with solutions to bond to loneliness. We could fail to solve the division problem. You could end up just linking people into very siloed communities full of people just like them. Um, and obviously that then has, you haven't solved the whole problem, would be my, my push. Okay. Um, on, this same, yeah. on this same one, um, you know, obviously both are important to think about, um, but I, I think on balance it is useful to start widening this conversation so that we are um, talking about loneliness <coughs> beyond um, that sense of craving, connection and intimacy um, with friends and family and people who we um, are meant to feel close to to broaden it so it becomes a conversation around a greater, around an existential state of loneliness in which people feel increasingly disconnected from each other, whether it is from friends or family or from fellow citizens, um, from politicians, from the state, recognising at the same time you're absolutely right that solutions are going to vary depending on what you exactly you're trying to you're trying to address but i think there's use um i think it's important actually to be broadening this conversation do you want to say anything or do you want to take the second one emma's question about you know about funding funding and also value valuing um this very important endeavor really so so i um I totally recognise the problem that you articulate. Um, so I, when I left Downing Street, I spent some time uh, working on a uh, kind of tech accelerator called Zinc, which was specifically set up to... Is that... Are you involved? Okay. Oh, fantastic. Well, but, but, that, but that... I mean, Zinc was set up to fill exactly the gap that you, that you identify, i.e. Um, venture capital funds and, and other kind of angel and other investors were focused on kind of broadly kind of commercial rather than... Um, kind of human-centred uh, um, kind of ventures. And uh, there was an enormous, well, I guess uh, Saul and Paul and others who found it were, were kind of thought that there was a big gap, and I agree with them. Um, the interesting thing, I think, is the tension that exists within that, though, because the reality is that lots of tech-focused investment is is driven by scale and growth and, um, uh, and ultimately um, creating kind of long-term usually subscribers, right? And actually, the, the, there may be a tension between that and some of the solutions that um, that some uh, kind of more kind of connection or human focused startups might be trying to trying to create. So I think there are there are probably things to work out in terms of how you align funders with the with the types of organisations that you're perhaps talking about. But I think there is an enormous opportunity. And it's clear to me that um, this whole space is very underserved currently by um, not just tech, actually, but just generally kind of um, uh, kind of companies and, uh, and different products and services. Like it, it, it's kind of it's something we all know, it's something we all talk about. And yet there are no kind of really substantial organisation. I mean, I think the best community focused organisation in the country at the moment is Parkrun, um, uh, which is <laughs> uh, it's kind of completely brilliant, but it's, um, it's free and it's, yeah, it's not, it's not the type of thing that someone like that would invest in. But that's, that's the hopeful thing, isn't it? The, to, it kind of answers the third question that something like Parkrun, which is what, five years ago it started? When was it? 
Ten, maybe ten. Yeah, I think it's ten. Ten. Yeah. ten. I mean, it just took off, and 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 I th also I know I'm a, the chair, but I can't stop talking. <laughs> um, the um, the the your question, Jill. There are some interesting things to think about. Divorce rates, especially among older couples, is going up, and that's resulting in a new wave of loneliness. And so, what was a bonded relationship, they that, that person then seeks out something in the bigger community. So there's constantly a conversation between your, in, as Narina puts it, your intimate circle and the world which you suddenly find yourself living in and don't know how sometimes maybe. Yes, thank you. Very yeah. brief point. I, I, I do think part of the problem is language. And so you know, I think it was just when you said you don't like the word community. I don't like the word community. <laughs> I mean, because what does it mean? Like, that's my problem. It's like a fluffy word. I like community. I just don't like the word community. <laughs> And like, so, I like the word belonging. Yeah, okay, okay, I'll give you a bit of belonging, you belonging. is okay. But I, I, if for me, if I'm trying to solve a problem, then you need to have a definition of what you're doing. And so for me, it was like, look, I can describe people like me syndrome. We can debate the academics on it, but it's pretty clearly a thing. And I can define a common life that can attract people who are different together and either uses ritual or intensity to create a trust and a bond. And we can go and see them. And we can see if we're going to invest in them or we're not. It's like a definite thing. But we talk about community activity in a way that's designed to appeal to local local government grants. It, it, if we did it about bridges, we'd go, what are you going to do? We're going to build a thing to get from there to there. Great. Do you know any more details? No. Like, no one builds a bridge like that. <laughs> you have a proper description of the architecture of what you're doing. And I don't think we talk about community in that way, which means there's not a market for what you're designing. And I, I find it deeply infuriating. So, reasons to be hopeful. Um, well, um, can I speak to that and at the same time um, address your question, Emma, about um, you know, fin fi financing and is there a role for the market to play here? I actually believe that I believe government has a really, really, really essential role to play here, but I do believe that the market has a role to play here and can play a role. I mean, we talked about, um, you talked about the Hudsa, the dancing. Um, in South Korea, there are these daytime discotheques, colatex, for elderly, for re elderly retirees, where thousands of people come every day and dance. This is yeah. a private sector yeah. initiative. This is businesses making money out of community. In fact, um, in my research, I found a number of goods and services being developed and um, you know being very successful that got me to define this whole phenomenon as the loneliness economy that there is an economy out here made up of goods and services designed to deliver connection and um, community that the market is um, that that is that the market is actually supporting um, of course it's always hard to get I mean, it's not easy to get financing for sure, but I think there. But I think, um, you know, we don't want to we wash community, so we don't want to just stick the tag on a product like was done with environmental products, um, so that oh yes, this is community, and um, you know there is of course a legitimate kind of danger there, and you talked about how hard it might be to get authentic. But from, let's say, the, the most we washed example of community, WeWork, just had an unbelievably successful IPO the other day. So, um, you know, if you think about Nextdoor, Peloton, um, other co-working, co-living spaces, <coughs> you know, they're actually getting kind of valued really significantly by the market. So I do think the market has a role to play here. I also think this move to ESG, so the greater interest in... Um, the investment community in environmental, social, and governance factors, which is increasingly going to be, looks like will be legislated for by the SEC in America and um, elsewhere, means that there are going to be more, there will be more investment money um, out there looking for homes. And at the moment, it's really the environmental side of this, which is, um, you know, really kind of the focus, but I do believe the social side of which alleviating loneliness, delivering community, providing connection, bridging divides, you know, will be an important part. And I think it's part of us as a community's role in this space to help make sure that 
the investment community, who actually has lots of money to put into this, is aware that the social matters too. So any good news, any hope? That's good news. Some, yes, that was very good news. <laughs> any other hopeful? Sir John wanted to come in, I'll go after him. WhatsApp, I think, provided a bit of hope, oddly. Um, I think the WhatsApp groups that sprung up in the pandemic were really hopeful little things. Some of them were vicious beyond <laughs> belief, but anyway, yeah, I'm get, being cynical. Should leave those ones. <laughs> but I, I, I was struck. It didn't happen on my streets, let me be honest. But, um, or maybe it did and I wasn't invited. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they were little uh, pockets where um, generally everyone on the street was asked to join, which meant people weren't picking quite so much. You're like me, you're like me, you're like me, you're maybe not like me. Um, and I thought it's just a little little thing that in some cases, someone wrote to me the other day saying that there's has evolved into a series of, of events and activities in their street. Um, so little signs of hope. So, so, so just building on what John said, so I, I agree with that. I mean, I think my, the big lesson from, for me from the pandemic was that there is clearly a huge amount of latent potential. So 700,000 people applying to the Royal Voluntary Service to be COVID uh, injectors. Uh, all of the WhatsApp groups um, that John describes, all of the people supporting at food banks, etc. Like it, there was a great outpouring. Um, but at the same time, I think what has become increasingly clear is that either there wasn't the institutional framework for that outpouring to be channeled in a productive way. And that actually is, I think, had quite a damaging effect on lots of people's willingness to kind of come forward in future. And I think we need to be very wary of that. Um, uh, and, and also, what has also, I think, become really clear is that government doesn't really know how to help. Um, there isn't really a policy playbook to... Big society? Think. What happened to that? Well, I think, well, John can talk more <laughs> about the big society perhaps than me, but, um, uh, that, I, I, but uh, what's interesting is that I think there is really a, there is a real political willingness to engage in this conversation now. Um, but uh, I think politicians recognise that they they have literally no idea where to start and they need the help of people in this room to do that. And so there is a great opportunity. We need to make sure we take it. Um, and that is a hopeful, I think, uh, message. But, um, but there's a hell of a long way to go. So we can have one last question before we have our drink. The gentleman. Here, there's a mic coming through towards you. Michael Newland. Uh, the most startling thing that's emerged to me from the pandemic is the growth of extreme risk aversion, which has been encouraged by government because the more risk averse you are, the more politicians can claim to be looking after you. The extreme risk aversion, the degree of risk aversion of last year would have been totally perplexing to, say, the generation of the Second World War, when they'd say something like, I don't care if the air raid siren's gone off, I'm enjoying my drink and I'm not going down the shelter. Now, if people are if people are risk averse to the degree they are now, how does that go encourage any kind of social interaction? Um, anybody volunteering for that last question? Anybody? I'm, yeah. ha I'm happy to come back on that. I mean, I think so. The one thing I would say is that I think the the type of risk that we've been dealing with in the last year and a half is of, of an order of magnitude different to some of the risks that we faced as a society collectively before just because of the exponential nature of the disease. And so I think there, there is a case for some of the um, risk aversion that we've seen, or at least some of the guidance from government over the last year and a half, just, just because if one person doesn't go around to an, uh, down to an air raid shelter, that doesn't necessarily um, endanger uh, the rest of the population. But if, if people uh, don't get vaccinated, then they do. So I think they, I think there is a case for some of the risk aversion. But your your broader point that we need people to be able to take risks and we need people to be willing to um, kind of step up and do things that they perhaps wouldn't normally do, I think is a good one. And I agree with you that government um, can get in the way of that in a, to a very large degree. And so a lot of what we need to do is to get government out of the way and to empower people, communities, neighbourhoods, etc. So it's a kind of a bit of both. Thank you. So may we all thank these three wonderful speakers. Uh, they made me think a lot and I learned a lot. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things I hope that happens is that these very nice cozy words like community or, you know, linking and whatever that is, we're always aware of the dangers of not simplifying it and pushing something that may ha prove to kind of produce results you don't really necessarily want. Now, I'm going to give you this idea that I am not patenting. It's one I really wanted to do, and I think somebody should do it.
I wanted to open a place called Friends, where there would be a restaurant, a cafe, a creche, a games area for older people. It would be an open space. It would be entirely open to everybody in the local area. And for the first time, possibly, people across generations, races, background, could get to meet each other. My husband blew that idea down. I'll never forgive him. But it's yours. Do something like that. It's yours to take. Wouldn't it be great? I like it. A, a franchise of friends. Sounds great. Go with it. <laughs> I know, and I'll cut the ribbon when you open the first one. Thank you so much for coming and the drinks available. Um,